Um, so welcome to everybody who's joined us on this webinar. Um, it's really great to have so many um, people listening in. And we know that we've had just under 700 sign up. So um, hopefully many more will listen to it afterwards. And I've just said um, it will be recorded and it'll be put out on the Pasture for Life YouTube channel in the next day or so. Um, just to give a quick introduction to these webinars, um, this is the joint webinar with Plant Life and the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. It's the fourth in a series that we thought we'd do with Plant Life um, to celebrate um, species rich meadows, which are so important to pasture for life farmers and plant life. Tiny bit about each of the organizations. Plant Life is a charity. It champions the wildflowers, plants and fungi that provide the life support for all of our wildlife. From the open spaces of their nature reserves to the corridors of government, plant life lobby nationally and internationally to protect these plants, raise their profile and celebrate their beauty. And we from the PFLA have really enjoyed doing these webinars um, with them. It's been, we've learned so much. We've done a couple on different types of restoration. We've celebrated them. And today we're doing one on the economics of species rich meadows, um, mainly aimed at farmers. So the Pasture, Pasture Fed Livestock Association is also a, it's a community interest co uh, company, which is much like a charity, totally dependent on membership and donations, as is Plant Life. We've got 600 members, mainly farmers, uh, many of whom do already graze species rich meadows and pasture. But the other amazing thing about Pasture for Life farmers is that as we're all learning new grazing practices, one of the things we're finding is that this is leading to improved diversity in our meadows, meaning that we've got longer grazing periods and better grass and so we can make a better return on our grass. And I think Rob in particular will be talking more about that later on. So welcome to you all from outside. Um, and moving on to our speakers, I'm really excited to be able to tell you that we've got Matty Pucci here, who's um, done um, incredible research into hospital fields, which she'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, she's going to kick off the session. She's a qualified herbalist and woodland and orchard conservationist and has re recently conducted research into the value of these um, old hospital fields. We'll then be followed by Chris Clark, who farms, well, I say he farms at Nethergill in Upper Wharfdale. He's actually just about to move to North Devon. Um, a year or so ago, he wrote a report, Less is More, looking at upland farms in the UK, or po possibly just in England, um, and showed how he continues to show how um, a successful business needs to treat nature as a shareholder. He also happens to be chair of the English chair of the Nature Friendly Farming Network. So we're really looking forward to Chris to hearing more about your views on that. And then to end up, Rob Havard, um, who's a farmer, ecologist and Natural England advisor farming in Worcestershire. Um, Rob's now very well known to many people for his method of bale grazing and introduction of species into his farm in uh, Worcestershire. He'll talk about the economics of this and how savings on lower inputs and housing costs for his cattle can underpin his finances. So those are the speakers and um, behind the scenes, which are just as important, we've got Neil Hesseltine, who will be um, who, who, from the PFLA. He's a PFLA farmer up in Malham in Yorkshire. He also happens to be chair of the Yorkshire Dales National Park. And then from Plant Life, we have Matt Pitts, who will be able to answer any questions you've got to throw at him on um, plants and um, species related questions. Um, if you could use the chat to chat um, and the Q&A button for specific questions. We're going to try and operate this so that Neil and Matt answer questions as we go along, but they may actively decide not to answer a question because then it'll be left on the Q&A so that we can do it on the forum at the end. So we're hoping that the speakers will wrap up in around about 40 minutes, leaving us another half an hour to 40 minutes for questions and answers and discussion. So the whole session will wrap up by seven o'clock. So with that, um, I'm going to pass you over to Matty, who's going to kick us off um, with her presentation on hospital fields. Thanks, Fidelity, and uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm going to be talking a little bit about 
as she said, what I found out about hospitals here so far. I should say, first of all, I was educated in a rural uh, girls' grammar school in the 1950s, where science subjects were not thought to be appropriate. So I don't have a great formal background in science, but I spent many years working with herbal remedies. Um, and also, I think being brought up in a small holding has given me a kind of natural sympathy and interest in animals all my life. Like most people, I'm also, I've always been very interested in wildlife and nature documentaries, aren't we all? And with the new sophistication of camera techniques these days, we can see intimacies of animal life that we never saw before, including what seems to be, seems to be animal self-medication. We see elephants walking miles to find and eat clay. We see robins putting mint into their nest building. We see an orangutan um, chewing what are known to be anti-inflammatory plants. This is fascinating and it makes very good television, but it's not actually hard science. A lot of this still is anecdotal observations. Um, and what my first point is that we need to have some really unified research uh, raising the status of animal self-selection. Uh, this would give everyone, including farmers, confidence in working with this, which is something which we know is a phenomenon, but actually is a reality, a proved reality. I'm not saying they're not studies. There are studies, including ones about farm animals ingesting plants that are known to have medicinal properties, as um, in fact, Phoebe Miles quotes in her work on hospital fields. So it does exist, but not to a level that I think is enough evidence. I think the modern mind requires hard science these days before new information is absorbed. Um, <clears throat> in 2013, I saw by chance a program about a hospital field in Wales. And I thought, yes, that maybe this information is not really new at all, but really it's old lost science. So I decided to do my own research. This hospital field, some of you may already know of it, is a, a mixed hill farm in Snowdonia. And the farmer, you won't mind me using his name, which is uh, Wim Thomas. He has at the moment 3000 sheep, he has goats, he has a couple of horses, sometimes he has pigs, and last year he also has llamas. He's been farming in that area for generations on the same farm, and his hospital field is the only one still in operation in the valley. He takes his hospital field completely for granted. He has used it just like his father and grandfather did, and for all manner of uh, complaints with his animals. Uh, one of the most dramatic, perhaps, is his horse. One of his horses in 2011 developed a very badly infected foot because it trod on rusty wire. And the vet used several treatments and then concluded that it had to be euthanasia. But Gwyn put his horse in the hospital field where it grazed for a month and it recovered completely. So as I say, he takes everything for granted in his hospital field, doesn't add anything to it doesn't take anything out of it and has, according to him, complete success. Um, since I've known him, the field has been used for twin lamb disease, for bloat, for mite infestation, feather mites, for uh, joint ill, which is, I think, bacterial arthritis in a lamb, um, blindness, eye infection that caused blindness in a lamb. He says the lamb was so blind it was walking into the fields and actually walking straight into the walls. Um, and the other thing that was used last, this was last year, was scour, you know, really desperate diarrhea in a goat. So I also know that that field, his hospital field, has been surveyed by one of the universities in Wales. Um, I don't know how long the survey took, but they concluded that there was something like uh, 60 different plants in his field. So it sounds quite remarkable. And you're probably imagining some really big expanse of sward, which you may be disappointed. Uh, Ben's going to put up a photo for you to see the reality. Right. 
Brilliant, thank you. So there's two views of this field. You may be surprised. This is the first one where you can see how close it is to the farmhouse, which is above. And the other one, which is the view down the field. Um, and you can see what a steep slope it is. And there's the Franken Valley, which is rather beautiful. But you may be surprised to know that this hospital field is not really a field in any sense at all. It's 39 meters going up and only 16 meters across. And apart from one big ash tree on one side, there are no other bushes or shrubs around the outside. It does seem remarkable that such a small area could have done so much good for so long. Um, I, as I've said, have visited it twice and on each occasion, I have found about 25 plants with known um, medicinal action. Um, last year, I took a uh, um, far more qualified medical herbalist friend with me to verify my findings. So incredible, but not science. No farmer in his right mind would change his grazing habits and try to develop a hospital field just on the basis of that kind of information. I wasn't able to find any other hospital fields in England, but in a couple of years ago, someone from the Ulster Wildlife Trust contacted me and said they knew of a farmer who had what was called medicine fields. Perhaps I'd be interested. Um, this was a, a beef cattle farmer in Fermanagh. And so last year, after I'd been to Wales, I went straight to Ireland, expecting to find something similar a small enclosure close to the farmhouse with easy monitoring of the animals. But in fact, I found something completely different. He took me about a mile away from the farmhouse and showed me 300 acres of the most superb pasture, which had been traditionally managed in his family for at least four generations. And uh, I'll show you some photos of those now. <coughs> Now, these first two photographs are actually from the plant life archives. Thank you, Matt. And you will, what you can see is you won't be able to see very much detail, but you can see there's lots of color and variety in the field. High plants, nothing, nothing looks demoralized at all. This is the second one. And then coming up are the photographs from the field. This is the farmer. I've shown his back through is a very modest man, wouldn't want to be identified, but you can see how uh, how high the grass is. There should be one more there, I think, yeah. Yeah, this is another one. The plants you can see in the foreground are orchids, as you could see in the plant life photographs. And uh, as the farmer said, don't they blind your eye? And they really do. You can also see around the perimeter of the fields that there are lots of shrubs and trees and there was everything you could imagine. There was hazel, uh, blackthorn, hawthorn, bramble, ivy. Uh, it was a real buffet for uh, grazing and browsing animals. Now, the farmer's very clear that these are not hospital fields. He doesn't use them for sick animals at all. He says he rotates the grazing so that his animals come through here when, in his words, when they look a bit dull. And this is my second point, that animal self-selection of plants is not just self-medication, it's also self We do know that animals adapt their nourishment. I mean, I think all animals do, maybe except humans, or maybe when we're pregnant, maybe we do then, but that's another seminar, isn't it? Um, there is a, a study, for example, that, um, I'll just check my notes here, which one I've got. Um, yes, this is, it's, yes, that um, sheep will consciously seek out and eat more clover when they're pregnant because they need the extra protein and then revert back to their natural eating patterns after the birth. Uh, we know that pigs are omnivores, uh, but who would have thought that they would dive underwater in a pond to find freshwater mussels. I mean, where, where has that been in their DNA all these years? Um, and then an American, some comments about an American studies. I want to recommend to you a book if you're interested at all in animal nourishment. This is a book by 
Dr. Fred Perenza, it's just called Nourishment, it came out two years ago and contains a wealth of studies about animal nourishment. One thing he stresses all the way through is that each animal is individual in its preferences, its feeding patterns and its, and its needs. And um, uh, yeah, this follows all the way through his, his thinking really. I think he's probably uh, quite a, a worthy person because not only is he an academic, but he was a rancher for seven years. So I think he knows a bit about farming. He quotes a very, very sad study about from the American feedlots, which I think must be purgatory for grazing animals. They're given a composite meal, which is ground up together. So it must be a kind of half powder form. And in the study, some calves were given the components from that separately and allowed to select what they wanted. Um, each animal took something different in different amounts at different times because they're individual feeders, as he keeps stressing. The interesting thing was that the animals that could self-select actually ate less and therefore was more economical than the ones who were given the complete meal and they grew at the same rate. Now, this is a very interesting thing, isn't it? Um, I think it's pretty interesting anyway. Um, but I do recommend that book. Now, my third point is an obvious one, that what you're looking at here on the screen pastured um, flower meadows, you call them flower meadows, you can call them diverse pasture. I call them natural pasture actually, but these things are by default also medicine fields and could be hospital fields. And I'm thinking that if the research about animal self-medication, self-selection, which actually has a very proper name, zoo pharmacognosy, that's its official name, sounds very good, doesn't it? Um, if that can be accepted as evidence, as reality, and it's combined with the use of these restored meadows, this would have an enormous economic impact on farming because there will be, for example, less acreage required, less uh, supplementary feed, food required, less possibly veterinary fees, less, less methane actually, better quality meat and the most amazing ethical position to be in as well. So to conclude, I am going to continue researching historic hospital fields. And if anyone has ever found anything resembling one, I'd be very glad if you let me know. I've written an e extract, an abstract, from which these are extracts, um, about hospital fields themselves, which you're very welcome to look at if you contact me. And so I'm thinking that maybe um, I will just continue the research I'm doing, collecting data, uh, raising awareness and look forward to the future of farming. So maybe actually the past can save the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matty. That was fascinating. Matty, lots of people on the chat have been asking for that book. Could you just um, hold it up again and yeah. just read out its um, title and the author, please? Yes, it's Dr. Fred Perenza, Perenza, P-R-O-V-E-N-Z-A. And it's just called Nourishment. Brilliant. Well, I think that's a really stimulating start to this discussion. And I'm sure that those of us who farm and whose animals grow species rich um, grasslands are aware that actually we don't have great vet bills and one of the things that the PFLA did a few years ago was to survey its members and again a bit like Matty saying this is anecdotal evidence but I think that most of um, our members have as they've taken stop feeding cereals and put more emphasis on their species rich um, grasslands they also see a subsequent decline in vets bills so I think that it's you're absolutely right Matty it's a fascinating area one that is worthy of more research. So, Chris, um, if we could move on to you, please, to um, to say what say say whatever you need to say. I'm going to share my screen right from the start. I hope. Okay. So, um, the title, the economics of species-rich meadows, is the one I was given. But for me, that title has an umbrella, uh, an umbrella vision, balancing food 
farming and nature. And so I'm going to concentrate on both those things and, and show you how the economics of species rich meadows relies entirely on balancing food, farming and nature. And I'm going to start with this, this photograph. This is a photograph of a hay meadow at Nevergill. And as Fidelity said, um, I'm, I moved from here in July and I'm about to buy a, uh, move on to a farm uh, in North Devon uh, on Tuesday. But this um, hay meadow is about 1400 feet and it's looking down Wharfdale, or Upper Wharfdale. The, uh, our house isn't the one that you can see in, in the middle ground, our farmhouse is to the right of this, of this photograph. But it illustrates that um, the type of meadow that we were beginning to develop from between 2010 and 2015. And we did this predominantly because we reduced our stocking rate. Now, we didn't realize that when we reduced our stocking rate, um, we would get uh, more nature and more profitability. And so I'm going to talk about how that was achieved. And I'm also going to talk about the less is more uh, report that we wrote um, last year, about this time last year. And I'm going to include within the evidence I'm going to show you the further 40 farms that we've been to, and we've either analysed them virtually or I've actually sat around the, the, the kitchen table. So what you're, what you're going to hear this evening is a result of nearly 80 farm business reviews. Um, when we go on to farm, it is entirely business based. I do not try and um, tell farmers how to farm. What I do do is tell them where their business is. And again, so what you're going to hear uh, tonight is about business, of which farming is a business. So um, the business model that we have found and, and now have developed affects both farming and conservation. You will, I hope, by the end of the 14 or 15 minutes, um, understand that there is a inextricable link between good farming, good conservation, and good business. And there are six concepts that we now talk about when we go on to farm. I'm only gonna talk about four tonight. Manage landscape, free issue, the concept of free issue, natural capital, and MSO, maximum sustainable output. How you calculate where that maximum sustainable output is on a farm. There are two others, ESI, Environmental Stress Index, and Return on Total Assets. We'll leave those for another time, perhaps. So a viable farm business with nature. The two are inextricably linked. So let's start with the managed landscape. You can see the picture on the right-hand side. Again, looking down Wharfdale, stone walls, um, hay meadow beginning to de develop uh, in, in the foreground. This is a, a landscape that has been managed over 400 years or more. It's an entirely man-made. But what's happened in that period of time is that farming and nature has got into balance. They are in equilibrium, long-term equilibrium. And because of that e equilibrium, unless nature delivers a commercial farming benefit, there is no value to natural capital. What do I mean by that? Well, because there's this equilibrium, if we don't look after nature, we are not going to get farming that we need to get. So as a result of that, if we, for example, totally destock a farm, that will result in a decapitalization of natural assets, a decapitalization of nature, as farm incomes are reduced. So, not only does it detrimentally affect nature, it detrimentally affects a farm business. But on the other side, if you have too many stock, um, if, you, if you go beyond the MSO, that maximum sustainable output, with too many stock, you will also decapitalize nature and um, reduce the, the profitability, the viability, the resilience of that farm business. There is a sweet spot, and I'll show you that um, again, uh, in, in a minute. But that sweet spot was where nature and farming and business come 
together. So there's this concept of free issue. What do I mean by that? In farming, we get free sunshine, free rain, free fertility, free grass. It comes courtesy of nature. We pay nothing for that. We, as farmers, would be much worse off if we had to buy that grass in. So by virtue of the cost avoided, this free issue makes a significant contribution to farm profitability. If we had to buy it in, we'd be significantly worse off. Without free issue, farm, business, farm businesses would be even less viable than they are now. Natural capital got this fragrant orchid. This is a photograph, uh, not a photograph, a common spotted orchid, I think. Um, and this, in our hay meadows, these began to reappear as we reduced our stocking rate. And, and actually, as we introduced cattle um, to replace some of the sheep. And suddenly we found these, these orchids taking, not taking over, but becoming more, more uh, prevalent in our, in our meadows uh, and we had done nothing. They had been there, uh, hidden for, uh, for certainly for 15 years while we were there, but probably for a lot, uh, a lot, a lot longer. So, natural capital, in my view, a much used but ill-defined term. What do I mean by that? Well, there's to have any helpfulness, any utility, natural capital has to have a definable characteristic. It has to be quantifiable, and it has to fit into accounting conventions. I don't think we have a definable characteristic uh, in this country about what natural capital is. It is certainly not quantifiable. We are, I'm still trying to find, and I understand that there's no internationally approved uh, methodology for defining and calculating what the value of natural capital is. And once you define that, how does that fit into our accounting conventions? Is it P&L? Is it balance sheet? Is it both? And if we can't measure it, if we can't measure what natural capital is, we can't ask for a revenue to come from that. At the moment, the revenue is dictated by income foregone. That is not a measure that, that, that stands uh, any research. So natural capital, it's, it's the asset that gives a farm to, farm businesses access to the free issue benefits. It is the result of free sunshine, free rain, free fertility, free grass. And if we manage that properly, we will get uh, a natural capital that has real value. So if we are given, if nature gives us the free issue, free pro bono um, asset, it should really be treated as a stakeholder in a farm business and so it should be put on the balance sheet we should be putting nature on the balance sheet so if you get your your, your treatment of this free issue right and if you get the management uh, relationship between nature and farming correct you get all sorts of things like orchids coming in and in our case we also began to get red squirrels but if you treat nature as a shareholder, as a stakeholder, it doesn't behave in the same way as other stakeholders or shareholders. If I invest, or if you invest more particularly in my business, then you will expect to receive a dividend. And I would then put your investment in my business on the liability side of the balance sheet. Because you are investing in my, my business, you will want either a dividend or a discount or you want some sort of interest payment. Nature doesn't ask for that, but because it's an investor, it should be looked after, stroked gently, and given a place at the kitchen table. Now that, a place at the kitchen table, has come very recently from someone who I've worked with who now has... <coughs> at their partners' meetings, their, their farming partners' meetings, an empty chair with the word nature as a sign on that chair. Nature is being actually treated as part of that farming partnership. 
So where do we get all this from? Farming believes in the standard economic theory of the firm. I'm sorry about this, but I just need to go through a bit of e economics with you. So we've got two axes, revenue and costs up the vertical and output volumes um, along the horizontal. There's a revenue line. Um, there's a fixed cost line. And there's your variable cost line there. And where the variable costs cross the revenue line, you get break even. And beyond that break even, you get profit. And that is what drives every single farm business in this country at the moment. Okay. And what that implies is that there's a linear relationship between variable costs and volumes of output. As you increase the number of lambs or the increase the number of uh, cattle sold, there is a linear relationship. So there's an economies of scale. There will be profit at some point in volume. This, we have found, doesn't work. This concept of driving production to get um, more profit not on, on none of the 80 farms has this or does this work. So if you're thinking as farmers of trading your way out of a, um, a, a no deal Brexit or a reduction in um, support mechanisms, it won't work for you. And I'll show you why. Instead of the standard economic theory of the farm, we found that there's an economic reality on the farm. And so we have the same axis, um, and the same revenue stream, the same fixed costs. And here we have the um, variable costs, but I've stopped them at that point. I've, I've shaded and hatched the, the rest of the variable cost line. Why have I done that? Because actually in farming, variable costs do, do, do that. And, and so we have the problem here, that between here and here, are the costs associated with the naturally available free issue grass. And what farmers then try to do, and we've called those productive variable costs, we don't have to worry about the nomenclature at this point. But what farmers try to do is try and drive production, and I was one of them. They try and drive production. And when they drive production, called CDCs, corrected variable costs, they try and correct for the disadvantages, particularly in the hills, of altitude, elevation, if you like, um, precipitation, latitude, and soil type. And actually, you break even at that point, your most profitable point is at that inflection point, at that point there. That is where the farm business is at its most profitable. And if you try and drive production beyond, so somewhere here, so we'll try and get a straight line, somewhere there, you are, have moved into loss making. And most of the farms, 80% of the farms we've dealt with, are in this area here. They have gone through this triangle of profit making, dri driven production, and gone into loss making. I hope that's all making a bit of sense. But also, if you are at this end and you are understocked, you are also. Um, losing, you're not creating enough, enough profit, but you're also decapitalizing nature as well, and you need to move this way with your stopping rate. This is the sweet spot that I was talking about early on. I, I hope that's making a little bit of sense. So when we go on to farm, we can devise strategies that allow them to decrease their stock to get to MSO. It is, it is at MSO, maximum sustainable output, but a farm business, and it doesn't actually matter whether it's a livestock farm or an arable farm or a mixed farm, there's an MSO for every single farm. So in the economic realities of the farm, they are non-linear variable costs, non, not linear, where the, there's a, uh, you make your most money, where you're making the most use of the free issue grass, the naturally available grass, and you are working with nature at that point. So, your best, um, uh, so when you work with nature, if you, go, if you try and drive the production, you will be substituting for nature and you'll move into a less resilient farm and probably a loss in it. The, the most productive area for hay meadows is at that inflection point. 
that is where you're going to get the um, the most benefit from species rich hay meadows and they will be created naturally and be really interested to have a discussion uh, with with Natty about about this later on because some of the stuff she found I found really interesting. Let's just move on to the next one. So what are we going to do about this? What are the farming strategies? If you're going to get your farm up and running and get your hay meadows to their best, there are some sequential uncongruent steps. You've got, in farming, you've got to maximise and set your prices. Well, we don't do that and we can't do that. But what you can do is gradually move your activities to an MSO level. And if you're above the CBCs, you need to reduce those progressively. Reduce your fertiliser, reduce your feed, reduce your vet and med costs. Um, and the hospital field, uh, obviously, I'm sure, would help enormously in that. And you need to maximise the benefit of the impact of natural capital by getting as much free issue natural grass as you can. You need to reduce your fixed costs, this is what we've found out in, uh, on, on the edge of farms, and move down an added value route if you can. Last slide. And so, so if you're going to do a farm strategy like this, you need to invest time in business planning. Finally, by operating at MSO, a livestock farm is going to be at its most profitable, it's going to maximise the natural capital, it's going to minimise the change imposed on the environment, and it's going to avoid the purchase of feedstocks, purchase concentrates, artificial fertiliser, which they will, which it will in turn have consumed huge amounts of energy in its production and its delivery. And, and you're going to get, because of all this, because of moving to MSO, you're going to get farming, livestock farming will not only move to uh, net zero, I believe, and we're just beginning to get evidence to show that farming, particularly livestock farming, can move to net sub-zero carbon economy when you go to MSO. Thank you very much. Chris, that was absolutely amazing, fascinating. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's very tempting to ask you some questions now, but we'll go straight on to Rob, um, Rob Havard, um, who's now going to tell us how he's been doing it in Worcestershire. Over to you, Rob. Thank you, Fidelity. Um, I hope you can hear me. I've turned the sound back on. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'm going to focus on mainly on the on the improvements that we've made in terms of the diversity in our pastures and what that means to our business um, and how we manage that to reduce costs. Um, and so I'll try and share the screen now if I can, just to show. Um, right, is that coming up? Yep, that's fine, Rob. We can see that. OK, so, um, yeah, so just to say um, we are we farm just over a thousand acres, um, none of which uh, I own. Um, we've got about 44 acres family small holding and then all the rest is rented land. Um, and since about 2012, we've built the business up um, through the cash flow from, you know, running a, a kind of a, a diverse forage business based on the principles of holistic grazing, holistic management. Um, if we just, if I can just see if this moves on to the next slide. So can you see that slide if I click on it like that? Because the slideshow isn't working. Is that working yep. okay, Fidelity? It yeah, it is. Nice picture, yep. Good size. Yeah, so <laughs> that is, um, so that's one of our pastures. And, and uh, as you can see, some of that, some fattening cattle we had in, in that section there. Um, you know, full of wildflowers. And as you can see, as we're grazing, we're leaving a lot behind. Um, what we try and do is, is, is create permanent pastures wherever possible. So we don't want to have temporary pastures. We're not looking at herbal lays. We're looking at really diverse meadows that are also really productive. And so what we really want from that is a, is a balance of grasses and a balance of wildflowers um, throughout our pastures. Um, the real benefit of that is that diversity in the um, structure above ground is then mirrored below ground. So sort of as above, so below, you tend to get, you know, the taller tussock grasses 
um, also have tend to be much deeper rooting and um, and they tend to drive through any compaction and help with infiltration, which helps with our outwintering and, and it saves money that way. Um, that's a kind of just to illustrate a photo really showing that as a rule of thumb, the above ground biomass more or less equals the below ground biomass. And so if we were grazing short rather than grazing tall, uh, we'd be limiting the potential rooting depth that we're putting in there. And you can imagine walking on soil with those different kinds of rooting depths that are shown in the picture. And particularly as we, we save money by outwintering, um, the root mass that you see on the right hand side of that photo is, is so much greater and it, and it has a, really holds the cattle up right through the winter, even though we're farming in many places on heavy clay. And we do have we have all sorts of um, soil types across the holdings that we farm, um, but that gives us a real benefit. And in particular, a part of that is that we have we we like to have a base of coarse grasses, the tussock grasses like cocksfoot and tall fescue, uh, which we find if we manage with tall grazing and then leaving long rest periods for the wildflowers to set seed, so that we've always got those species coming back in. Um, then that provides the right habitat for those um, tussock grasses. And the tussocks themselves are fantastic for in small invertebrates and therefore small mammals, nesting bird, ground nesting birds and all of that sort of thing. So it really helps on that side of it. Um, in terms of our grazing system as well, what we tend to see with continuous grazing or sometimes called set stocking is selective grazing will mean that animals will select the, the plants they find the most, um, uh, th their favorite plants, essentially, they just keep going back to. And you can see in the picture there that the very short plants could represent those that are, are constantly regrazed and they really struggle to keep root mass. You'll probably see a lot of uprooted grass. Um, you'll see a lot, lot of uprooted herbs and herb species actually suffer from this more. And, and then the one that isn't grazed is a demonstration of a plant that could be a weed species or a weed grass that you might not want, um, or a, a rush that you might not want in huge quantities that's doing really well because it's ungrazed because of that selective grazing. So we do try and graze off everything at least once a year as tight as we can. Um, when, we're, when we're managing that grass, what we're trying to do is 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 to make sure that we're leaving enough behind so that the soil's covered and we're also allowing everything to set seed so that we're having a little bit of animal impact um, from the cattle hooves and all of that sort of stuff making sure the cattle are always full as they move on to the next paddock if we're grazing through the flowering season we'll make sure we leave at least half the flower heads so that there's enough um, seed being set and then we'll find that the bit that gets grazed off actually then comes back and, and will will then flower in the following um, rest period. So then we end up with really long flowering periods right into November. Still got lots of flowering plants at the moment. And so for things like invertebrates that are coming out of hibernation or in and out and, you know, providing a food source for things like bats across our pasture, it's really good for the ecology that we have. Uh, this is just a photo here or an example here of how we split the fields up with electric fencing. Um, and just by managing it with electric fencing, we, we save money. You know, if, if that was one field and we kept the cows in there for 30 days and then moved them into the next field, then the regrowth in that field, um, you know, regardless of inputs or anything else, the regrowth starts on day 31. If we were to split that field up into, say, 30 day sections and, and, and move them every day, then the regrowth starts in the first section on day two. And so we get an extra 28, 29 days of growth or regrowth by the time we've come out of that field. So we're working with nature to save money with our native pasture. And it's been shown that if you if you regraze the growing plant, then that can add on another 21 days in terms of when you're, that plant's going to be ready to graze again. And so by working with the plant physiology rather than against it, it means we then don't have to buy the um, artificial fertilizers and the field amendments in order to get the plants to grow. We're just trying to work with nature to make sure we've got that productivity. Um, something else we try and do, particularly in the winter, 
is is again through strip grazing it helps us manage the nut nutritional take of the animals so here we have this is our winter stockpile and we'll we'll try and ensure that when the animals are grazing this this that because we're splitting it up and they're getting more or less an equal nutritional bite every day as we move the livestock each day um, if we were to just give them this uh, this picture here is actually it's a 130 acre field and so if we just gave them that field all you know, you know, to go at all the time, they'd walk over it all and they take the best on the first day and they walk all over it the second day. And every day the nutritional value is going to decrease. So by using electric fencing and moving them every day or every other day, it helps us to meter out and make sure they're getting an even bite of nutrition every day pretty much, um, which is that slide there. Um, so you can see we've got massive wildlife benefit. And the key thing is, is that when we're talking about reducing those costs, you know, it's great to see from Chris the comments on, um, you know, the fixed costs and the variable costs. I think sometimes in farming, we assume a lot of costs are fixed when perhaps they're not. So there's a real opportunity to reduce fixed costs and a real opportunity to reduce variable costs. So the triangle that Chris was showing of profit profitability, you can certainly increase that area so that you've got a greater margin between your revenue and the combination of your fixed and variable costs. And that's absolutely something we try and do. And I think the way farming's going and the, the you know the loss of BPS, um, the subsidies, um, I think that we're going to have to be a bit cuter. You know that that. That subsidy check each year is, a, is an insurance policy for a lot of people who might farm a lot cl closer to those lines in terms of the maximum profitability they can make. But in a bad weather year, they're often going to find that that's going to be that's going to be difficult. But if you get a subsidy check, then that helps you when you get those bad weather years. And I think the risk factor of having an awful lot of money out the door in a high input system. So you've got money for fertilizer, money for feed money for extra machinery, for more intensive management of the grassland, um, you know, putting lays in, you know, re, uh, reseeding lays every four or five years or so, you know, all these costs are going to add up and it's all money you spend a long time before you get money back through um, through the cattle. And, and that's a high risk system when, you know, essentially it's a volatile commodity market that underpins the price we're getting. And so we have to be really careful about spending that money before we get there. And I think when we're looking at these pastures, the key thing for me is is looking at the, the maximum quantity of forage we can produce. And that's where those coarse grasses come in. Um, and then we compare that against the quality of, the, of that of that production. And I think the key is for me is 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 matching your your maximum production that you can produce at the cheapest possible cost. Um, rather than maximum production regardless. And I think that's something we've got into within agriculture a little bit, particularly with our ryegrass lays in, in livestock farming, where we've got huge production levels um, in the grasses, 14,000 kilos of dry matter per hectare and so on. But there's a huge cost to producing that as well. And, you know, and if we can produce similar amounts of forage for less, but there might be less quality, but then the key thing is then that you match your animal genetics to that quality of forage because if you do that and still produce a marketable calf or offspring um, then you're going to be producing far more profit and you're going to have a lower risk business um, we aim for sort of maximum diversity in all of our fields so and we're increasing when we're taking on more land we increase the diversity all the time orchids seem to pop up very quickly things like tall fescue native tall fescue and coxfoot seem to come in on their own even where We've taken on sort of almost damaged, overgrazed, sheep grazed pastures with very little diversity and things are start coming in already um, just from themselves, from the seed bank. Once we get the management that fits them, orchids tend to come in um, within three or four years. Often we just they'll start popping up because of those rest periods. The mycorrhizal fungi in the soil that's associated with the orchids seems to thrive with the rest periods that we give with our grazing system. Species like dropwort um, appeared in meadows that we never thought we'd see in a relatively rare plant. Uh, you know, we've got um, Burnett saxifrage, uh, golden saxifrage. And then the tall grass we leave over the winter, we've got great grey shrike hunting, you've got short-eared owl, cattle egrets, or sorry, what, um, little egrets popping up 
um, when they're on passage, just passing through, and we're seeing more and more of that as they come through. Grey partridge have really started to pop in. Loads of barn owl almost coming straight away. And the starlings follow the cattle all the time at this time of year. Um, kestrels following the small mammals in the tall grass. So there's a real biodiversity benefit to everything we're doing with the grazing, but we're also getting a, a business benefit as well, producing some good stock. So just in terms of the, um, the business performance, uh, when we've done um, a finishing system for uh, cattle, taking them in about 15 to 17 months, running them for about 12 months, um, and we finished all cattle by about 20, 28 months um, overall, and that's outwintered on stockpiled forage with no hay. So the only cost really was the rent on the land, um, a bit of electric fence equipment and labour and the labour involved. And so, you know, you've got such a low cost base for that kind of system, um, you know, anything you add on, um, that 0 0.8 kilos per day you can see in, in live weight gain but that mean you know that's a reasonably respectable gain particularly considering that includes winter grazing and so we're probably one and a half plus during the summer um, you know that you know you're every you know all the time you're moving forward with that kind of system and and that's allowed us to grow our our family business from 44 acres to over a thousand just from the cash flow from the business all the profits we've made every year I've, I've put back in. I haven't taken a wage out of the business and that's allowed me to build a sustainable farming business to that, to that level. And that's made a, you know, a big difference. Um, real test last winter was with the outwintering, which saves us a lot of money. Um, we're the wettest winter on record. Um, and it was a year where I'd attempted to winter um, on one of the farms, the equivalent of the national average stocking rate with no buildings, just with hay feeding, hay rolling um, of species rich hay, hay uh, and feeding that through the winter. And actually everything did really well. Um, we had one field we, that we thought we'd destroyed, but if you have a look on my um, Twitter feed, which is on sort of Feps and Angus, you'll see that what the field looked like in May and then what it looked like in September and the recovery because we apply the rest periods it has been absolutely incredible and the increase in diversity in organic matter in the soil as well has been really good. Um, so we run, you know, it's good to see Chris's again, Chris's shot of the revenue, the costs, and we've talked about reducing variable costs. We've talked about reducing um, fixed costs. So, you know, as a, as a growing young business, one of the other things we needed to do was increase our revenues. And so by pe selling pedigree livestock, um, that was a way of doing that. Um, and, and so we aim, we often use, these are two half brothers that are native Angus. <coughs> and so we're looking for lots of capacity in the room. And so a nice uh, heart girth, lots of uh, room and in, in depth on the flank and then some good muscling. Um, and those native Angus are slightly smaller in stature than the modern Angus. They have lower energy requirements and they really thrive and, and finish really easily off these uh, native pastures. Um, something just to think about for those in agriculture was is, is to think about uh, EBVs, which is estimated breeding values. And it's they can be very useful. And I know a lot of people in grass fed and other areas are using them. It's just to be really careful with them um, because you can end up in a race to the highest number and that might not be what you want as chris really well explained you want to have optimum production not maximum production and unfortunately human beings what they are being what they are you know if everyone's got a number somebody wants the highest number and just be careful selecting on that sort of thing and the same would go for even things like feed efficiency tests where you've got to be really careful what you're selecting for on feed efficiency tests which you see for some of these breeds we actually just want moderate um, production, optimum production, everything healthy, everything easy carved, low labour costs because of that and making sure that um, and that fits in fitting your genetic animal genetics to what your plant genetics are. So producing your maximum forage quantity and then having cattle that can thrive on it essentially. Things like carving ease really important. You don't want to be pulling lots of calves. You can't afford that labour in the system anymore. Um, you look at the the, again how reductionist science can go wrong where carving ease direct selects for those animals that have calves e easily 
And if you're not, and, and what we've seen with that um, is if the calves are born easily, it can also be because those calves are narrow. And if those calves are narrow, and then you then keep those heifer calves, then they've got narrow hips, and then they don't carve easily. So by selecting for carving ease, you can actually select for carving difficulty if you're not careful. So carving ease daughters measures the ability of a cow's daughter or a bull's daughter to carve easily, which is a much better measure. So it's just very, we just have to be very careful. You're not picking one trait that actually could be taking you in the wrong direction on that kind of thing. Um, se selecting for maximum growth rate is also, can also be a problem because fertility is your number one profit predictor in, a, in, a, in an animal um, production system. And growth rates are antagonistic to fertility. So you don't, I won't go into the full detail of that now, but you can um, certainly go a, lo a, ro a long way wrong if you select purely on growth rates. And um, whilst it might be what the finishers and the, and the, uh, the cattle finishers want, it's not what you want as a suckler cow producer. You need fertility. You can use a terminal sire on that, on some of them, but make sure that your replacements are coming from high fertility animals. And you can breed those yourselves. You don't need to go to a fancy um, pedigree breeder. You can breed those within your own, within, within your own herd. Uh, yeah, and just with selecting on single traits, just be careful for what you select for, because you might just get it and it might end up not being quite what you hope for. In terms of cow, cows, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a really nice feminine cow that would maybe be a little too sharp a cow for some in the beef industry. But remember, this is a cow to produce calves. It's not a cow that you want to finish in itself for meat. And so I'm looking at the shoulder. You can see a prominent shoulder, which is a sign of fertility. You don't want those uh, the chine bones on the top of the spine to be overtopping, which shows it's got too much growth hormones, which will be dominating the sex hormones, and that has an impact on the fertility of the animal. I'm looking for a really nice clean udder. Um, and you can see that wedge shape from the shoulder um, down to the uh, lower thigh as you move across, look at the animal. Um, those are, you know, that's that was a heifer. Um, so she was just carved uh, and still had a very nice udder. And we select on all of those kinds of things. She's also got really good heart girth, so a lot of width between the two front legs. And that vital organ capacity helps her have low energy requirements as well. So we select for that too. Again, matching your cattle, and you can select for this from within your own herd, matching your cattle to the environment is the absolute key. And then those smaller cows actually will often wean a bigger percentage of their body weight. So this is a uh, this is a about nine, ten month calf at weaning. He's almost caught up his mother. Um, and, and I think that smaller cow, again, because you you're producing more carbs, um, there's a little stat on there which just shows because you're producing that many more carbs, you'd need to. Um, you know that's a 650 cow kilo cow as opposed to a 900 kilo cow um you know you look in market i was in market the other day and most of the cows were up near the 900 kilo um level the big charolais crosses and simmental crosses and the like and you'd need an extra 100 kilos per calf weaned in order to make up the difference in the extra calves that the feed requirements of the smaller cows give you and the key thing with that is that that extra 100 kilos comes at a cost because it comes at a cost in the maintenance requirement of the cow. So you're going to cost you more to keep that cow. So that extra 100 kilos isn't free. So you're not getting it's not all extra profit. And it, again, that optimum but not extreme production, which is what Chris was talking about and really well explained. Um, absolutely ideal. Um, we do have to produce for the market, though. And so we aim for our smallest heifers to finish at 275 kilos dead weight and that avoids the penalties of the processors um, and I want the cows as small as I can get without getting those penalties from from the big processors. Um, how am I doing for time Fidelity? Um, it's absolutely fascinating Rob listening to all this but I think we need to allow there's lots of questions to come up and can you do it in two Good more time. minutes? We stop at 25 two, yeah, and then will... two more minutes. If you can. Minutes, no problem. Yeah, thank you. Yes, no problem. Um, I think I, mean, I made the main points. I think looking at functional traits, you can, you know, people talk about different sort of traits. 
and they talk about fly uh, resistance and, and all of this sort of thing. But if you really want to just keep it simple, um, then if the cow rears a calf every year, trouble free, um, holds body condition and breeds back on time, then that's a really good cow. And if that's in a system that's grazing those um, diverse meadows, then you've got something that's matched to your environment that is fertile. And so actually that productive longevity is, is absolutely what you need. And, and looking at um, just a couple of things is, is old granny, we've got pedigree Angus where we are, and old granny was the first cow in the herd book of the pedigree Angus. Um, she produced 27 calves in 29 years, um, calving it first time at two, and then from then on had a calf every year for 27 years. And that is absolutely remarkable. But I think in, in you know, since the 1840s, when she entered into the, um, into the herd book, I'm not sure we've come a long way in animal genetics, to be quite honest. And I think the main thing is that other people start selecting on this basis so that we've got animals that fit these ecological management systems. And then there'll be more people I can go and fetch um, animal genetics from because we, we use quite a lot of our own genetics, but I need, we need other people doing it so that there's a broader range of things being managed in this way. That's just to show some of the orchids, some of the bale. So we're rolling bales out in the winter. You can see a heron coming. They like to come in for the protection of the cows and evolves and things moving. That's our bale pod where we have intensive bale grazing. So they poach the ground up a bit where we did it. But then following September, we've got lots of forage growth and lots of diversity coming in. Um, and the wintering costs are way down. You know, wintering a cow co costs you about, you know, on industry standard figures, about £2.50 a day. Um, and we're down below 80p a day for our wintering system, you know, so if that's saving you sort of £2.50 plus, um, sorry, you know, £1.50 plus, um, you know, per day per cow, these are serious savings you're making. And if you're producing the same amount of um, beef because you're producing more calves, even though they're slightly smaller uh, from that native forage, then um, you're doing something right. I'll probably leave it there. Great. Thank you, Rob. That is brilliant. I mean, we could listen to you all evening, really. There's so much information there. Um, the combination of the three speakers tonight has been really inspirational, I think, and it's going to be quite hard on picking up on all of these questions. So I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to start off picking a few out of um, the question and answer box, but I'm also then going to ask Neil and Matt to see if there are any themes that they would like to pick up on. Um, one theme, Rob, that's come up um, on a couple of questions is, um, and this could apply to everybody, is the role of sheep. You've, Rob's obviously covered entirely cattle. Um, so this question could go to Chris as well. Um, basically, is this sort of system viable with sheep as well? Rob, do you want to start with that? Um, yeah, I think you, you can be used for sheep. We used to have sheep and cattle running in the system together. But just for simplicity, we um, we we went out of sheep um, just to, onto one species. It was my simple brain. One one species was easier for me. Um, I think where I've seen it work best is where um, a farm is kind of almost split in two, and by running cattle on one half one year and sheep on the other half, and then swapping them over at similar you know at the, at the relevant stocking rates. It helps with the parasite burden, um, but also because you need to manage the grass slightly different for the sheep, it keeps it a bit simpler. Some people will use a leader follower grazing system with the sheep and cattle, and that can work. But I find that really complicated when you end up getting variations in weather, so sort of mini drought periods that then complicate your grazing and, and your recovery. So, so I think by separating it, that for, for me, that keeps it simpler. Chris, do you have a, any comments on that? Yeah, so um, of the 80, nearly 80 farms we've analysed, the farms that are doing, uh, are showing the best business results, the best margins, are ones that have sheep and beef. And with a slight predominance to more beef uh, LSU, livestock stopping rates. Um, 
than, uh, than, than sheep. So there's, a, there's a certainly a role for sheep and cattle in, in nature because of the different grazing um, and browsing te techniques. Mm. Interesting. Matty, do you have a view about the different grazing um, capabilities of sheep and cattle when it comes to your species rich um, hospital fields? You're on mute, Matty. You need to unmute yourself. I think it's as Chris said, they have um, they have different methods of browsing and grazing. So sheep are more intensively intensively graze, graze the sward. But something interesting in Wales, they put the sheep in um, cattle pastures early in the spring so they can eat off the buds of ragwort. So then it's no longer toxic and then it's safe when the cattle go in. You, you're not in, Chris, do you already know about that? So it's one example when they can be used together, but I would have thought normally they're kind of not the same, not, not similar enough to be used in the same land. Uh, Chris, do you know what I mean? I, I, I had heard that, but I'd only heard it from an old boy, you know, an old farmer who, who was using this, this te technique, but you're never quite sure how, uh, how accurate their, their methods are. But actually, the more I'm, I'm in this, the more I understand that pre-1940 uh, something or other, there was an awful lot of uh, information that we had lost exactly. from those farmers. Um, Thank you, Matty. There's another question which actually Neil has picked up. I've just asked Neil to pick out ones and I was just going to pick this one up, Neil, myself, um, about stocking rates. And I think this ties in with other questions about um, the amount of land that you need to um, manage the sort of system that Rob's doing. Um, I was really wondering again if um, any of you have got any points that you'd like to make about that and if possible to at the same time perhaps explain to our audience maybe if you can what the average stocking rate is whether indeed you think stocking rate is an important thing to be looking at um rob would you like to kick that one off okay yeah um i think the ahdb um surveys have shown that an average stocking rate was around about 1.6 to 1.8 cows um acres sorry 1.8 acres per cow um across the whole industry and i think we bear in mind that that includes lots of people who, those are the people who send all their returns and, and know what their variable costs and gross margins are and send them into uh, ahdb so you're probably self-selecting at the top end there um, and that's what we managed to winter last year um, I, I think there it can i know benchmarking is a useful thing but with, you have to be careful that it doesn't become too much of a competition and it pushes people past that sort of maximum sustainable output that Chris was talking about because they're competing with each other because every farm's different and you need to look at what works. And, and what we found taking on land um, is that initially, particularly if it's, if it's been... Um, you know, we've got some land that was taken on really intensive arable and so at the heart had really been farmed out of it and it's taken us at least you know three years in on that and we're still waiting to get that productivity back up through our management it's really just starting to kick in now but you have to i prefer to lag behind the productivity of the land slightly with our um stocking rate and so that as that productivity increases we just keep following it up Rather, I think if you have one year, whether you go over it and you do too much damage, particularly with our winter grazing, then you can cause problems. And just a quick note that um, with our acreage, acreage, we've just taken on another block. So and we will be increasing stocking rate on there. But a lot of that is scrub and woodland. And so it doesn't carry as many as many stock. And it's, it's you know, very hilly. Mm. Uh, just while you're on it, Rob, do you make your own hay or do you buy in hay? To feed your animals um we do a mixture so some of the land we have we've got requirements to that we where we have to make hay because of the stewardship um and so we do um, we made about i think i had 160 acres of hay down at one time uh last year um which was a bit nerve-wracking um but and then we do buy in some as well um which we I always want to walk the fields and know what I'm buying. So I try and buy species rich hay 
and I might just I buy I see the field and I'll buy the bales, you know. So I'll buy it before it's made, if you know what I mean. So I know I'm bringing in all that diversity. And then when you're feeding out through the winter and rolling those bales out, you're adding diversity, you're feeding the stock, you're adding organic matter. Um, so you're doing positive things all the time. Yeah. And just uh, again, another supplementary, with, from, which is a question from the audience, is that you've obviously got a very large farm. Do you think that smaller bee farms can provide the long rest periods that you clearly are needed under this system? Um, I think so. I mean, I think it comes back to that level of sustainable output. Um, and I would say that we started up with 44 acres and we built it up using this system from our cash flow. And so um so absolutely yes but i think we also have to accept that we're often unless you're selling direct then that we're in a wholesale market which has a certain price that it gives us and we we've, you know there's going to be a level of production necessary in order to um to justify a certain amount of labor yeah chris would you like to respond to the stocking rates question and those supplementaries as well if if you if you like yeah. to um i want to do it in a perhaps a, uh, a peculiar way. Um, we're, we're using stocking rate as a benchmark. And as, as Rob said, that isn't necessarily the right way to go at this. The only way, the only benchmark for a farm business is its margin. And if you get your farm at its, at its MSO, you will be at your most profitable. Now, every farm is different. The stocking rate on the, my neighbour's farm at Nethergill was different to mine because he was south facing and I wasn't, for example. So, so the only benchmark is margin. And, and although Rob talked a lot about uh, EBVs and, and, and such like growth rates, they are completely immaterial if they're causing you to lose money. And what we do on farm when we go onto farm is that we take and it's a matter of the revenue line and put it back in later on. We only measure the farm's output, farm success, on um, its non-support operating costs and non uh, miscellaneous income as well. And that gives us a really clear view. And let me just give you a couple of um, uh, statistics. We are getting farms, of the 80 farms, nearly 20 of those farms are not covering their variable costs. So if you don't cover your variable costs, there's nothing you can do to make that farm profitable. 20, so 20 on 80. 93% uh, of those 80 farms are not covering their variable costs and fixed costs. And so whatever they are doing, whatever benchmark they are using um, from wherever they're getting it from, are not working um, on, on those farms. 100% of those farms, of those 80 farms, are not covering their variable costs, their fixed costs, and their drawings without support. Hmm. So livestock stocking rates, uh, although I used I use that 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 term, um, is really a, a, only an indicator of getting down to MSO. The real indicator is margin. Very interesting. Um, I've been asking Matt and Neil to send over um, any questions and Matt's got a really interesting question here, which again, all three of you might like to comment on, which is what role do the panelists think that trees and hedgerows can have in terms of their economic benefits for livestock producers? And tying in with that, Rob, I think there's a question here. There was a question about um, mob grazing and providing that sort of choice in their diet and um, shelter as well. You might like to comment on that at the same time. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I think it can help. The more diverse the pastures you have, the better. Um, many of our native wildflower plants are high in condensed tannins, which actually improve the efficiency of the room. And a lot of the leaves of our shrubs and trees are also quite high in condensed tannins, which helps that as well. Um, and they'll self-medicate, so things like bloat, tannins help with that side of things, so that really helps with bloat. So yes, I do think there's a place for that. And obviously there's a bit of a bandwagon with tree, tree planting and silver pasture and all that sort of thing at the moment. Um, I think I would love to plant more trees, um, we're, but we're, we're very busy. And I think it's, you know, if you've got the time and you've got the money, great, but it's got to show a um a reward a financial reward for doing that for that activity 
you know there is an opportunity cost um, and so think about what you might be better spent doing so if you haven't got your pastures diverse enough i would just have a consideration on that um, and i think the other thing i'd say is that unless you're in sort of huge fields um, and sort of the sort of prairie land type arable farming scenario that actually our British bucolic landscape is, is, is already really good with diverse hedgerows and trees. And if we let those grow up, you know, we've had some Americans and Australians come over here and they come over and say, you've already got a silver pasture over here because we've got hedgerows around every field. And, and so just have a look at what you've already got while rather than assuming that you need to do loads more. Um, but yeah, I mean, wherever you can add a sort of an eco tone from a kind of a scrub edge through to a wildflower rich um, meadow is brilliant for ecology. So, you know, where you can do that, great. But, you know, if it's going to be at the cost of doing other things in your business, just consider that properly. Chris, what would you like to say about that? So, if we're going to go down an MSO route and match, that relies on the farm business not buying in fertilizer. Uh, bought in the uh, feed, bought in forage, uh, additional medication and overwintering. And what we found is that when you go down that route, there is a, a much more of a mosaic of habitat created by an MSO approach. So your, your profitability improving, and I know it's counterintuitive kind of all this, and again, everything that I was taught at college, when I went to college, was um, it's against all received wisdom, but if you go down the MSO approach, you would be better off. You will create this mosaic of, of habitats for nature. And what we were finding at Nethergill is that trees were naturally regenerating in places where there was no grazing. And so, and we're also finding that the cattle, when you when you turned them into uh, uh, fields where there were trees, they were browsing the leaves in exactly the same way that, that Rob was talking about. So for me, there is a, a need for trees, but I'm less convinced about planting loads of trees because they'll be planted in the wrong place quite likely. Matty, you um, touched on one of your fields having wonderful um, edge to it with lots of different um, tree species. Have you, you're on mute, by the way. I think you are. Oh, no, you're not. Um, no, you're not. Um, do you have any thought, I mean, do you have any points to make about that and the diversity in, in tree species? No, just to repeat mostly what Rob said, that uh, grazing animals are also browsers anyway, and it extends their possibilities of self-medicating as long as the trees are native or long established. I mean, that's a, a kind of grey area these days, isn't it? Because what is an indigenous species? But, but in principle, yes, they should have access to indigenous plants, which include trees. So yeah, why not? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm moving on now to another question, which is actually, there's several things coming out of this. I'm going to read this one out to you. It's a question for the panel. I'm a hill farmer with a lot of peatland moor, and even the in is acidic. How do they think cattle will be used without destroying the ground and releasing carbon into the atmosphere by exposing the peat? The farm altitude is 1,400 feet, running up to over 2,000, and the average rainfall is 60 inches. And tying in with that question, there was one um, from somebody who wanted to know about your views about, for instance, putting lime onto acid soil. So using inputs like um, imp soil improvers such as lime, a specific one for Rob, which is do you use the topper? Do you top off your fields at any time after the grazing has been through? So maybe just general questions about inputs, which uh, are sort of natural, but you know they're not chemical anyway. So I start off? Uh, yes, please do, Chris, yeah. So Nethergill was, um, the farmhouse was at 1,200 feet and went up to 1,800 feet, so not quite to 2,000. It was north-facing quite a little bit and very acid and a lot of blanket bog. And so there was no way that we could um, overwinter our cattle and be sure that we could feed them in bad weather. We couldn't get to them. So we had to bring them in. But the number of cattle that we had um, was dictated by the amount of winter forage we could make. And so what we then did was um, bring in our neighbours' cattle or sheep 
in the summertime. And that made sure that the grazing was at the right level in the summer. So we didn't have, we couldn't make enough forage in, in the summer to graze the amount of acres that we could put sheep and cattle on. So th there was, we were beginning to think, at the level, that actually cattle, uh, livestock in the way that we were trying to do them, even what wasn't going to work at all. We need dry ground to get the most profitable livestock from. Rob, would you like to answer that? And also, could you add into your answer, Rob, about how you deal with poaching in wet winters, um, especially on areas where Natural England aren't keen on supplementary feeding? OK, yeah, well, the first one was there was something about peatland that, that yeah. you know, managing. The first thing I'd say is that, that you're the expert on your farm. You've probably got the most experience of managing that land. And so, so I, I would you could tr the thing to do is to try think about trial and error and rather than aim for outwintering straight away which i do i see quite a few people jumping into this and deciding i'm going to do holistic grazing we're going to outwinter everything straight away we're going to do this that and the other just start by managing to improve your soil health and your infiltration into those soils um, and then think about how you can extend your grazing so that your housing period is as short as possible. Because then as Chris says, the shorter period that you're housing is that the less winter forage you need to conserve during the summer. So start with that process. And just if you can, you'd be amazed how easy it is to knock a month off either end and start that on the peatland or whatever. But I, I would say that I know some of the ecologists will disagree with me, but peatland is effectively a degraded habitat. And you need to you need to uh, restore that to a um, something where nutrient cycling is taking place again, um, and that is possible. Um, and it might need a bit of poaching to get there. How we manage poaching on our farm? We've got some really wet land. Moving quick um, in, on the wettest places in the winter, um, leaving plenty um, if we have to, um, and. But you'd be amazed, over, you know, we've got areas that we couldn't really do a lot of winter grazing on a few years ago. And now with the infiltration that we've got, it holds cattle up so much better than it used to. So whilst your soil at the moment, you might think I'll never winter cattle on that. Well, after five or six years of reducing or increasing the amount of grazing you have, the, reducing your housing and improving your soil health, you might find that you can do more than you think. And we do a bit of topping if there's a serious weed issue um, not really, mainly just to keep neighbours happy. Um, but if we do go topping, then it'll tr we'll try and time it so that it's right after grazing. So we're not cutting the growing plant when it's just started to regrow. So we graze and top straight away, leave the tractor there and then do the next bit. Um, but we do find that actually things like docks and thistles just get less and less over time with the management. <sighs> Great. OK, we've got four minutes left, in fact, three now. So I'm just going to quickly whiz through the last of the questions, which I and I apologise to anybody if we don't answer them all. But so in order, Matty, the first ones will all have been at you uh, for you. And it may be that you can we can in some way get this information to people. But you're, we're being asked if there's a list of medicin medicinal herbs that are relatively easily accessible and possible to establish. Um, also tied in that, um, Matt, Matt, you're being asked if you could give some examples of wildflowers and their medicinal properties to livestock. Well, there's not really time to do that now. So I don't know if, if we can somehow get this information out um, to everybody at the end. Um, do you want to just quickly respond to those as to whether that's the sort of information that you've got? Um, yeah, I think somebody asked if I could actually put, I could give you the 25 that I found each year on the Welsh hospital field. I could do that and then that would relate to the most commonly found plants at that level anyway. So I could do that. Yeah. Yes. Not yeah. now. Not, I haven't got time to do it now, but I could, I could, I could send it to you and with a comment yeah that could be done thank you and actually this might be a question for rob and chris but the the sort of the multi-species herbal lays that people put in often for, for three or four years do we think they've got um, enough diversity in them to have the same benefits as natural meadows quick yes and no answer Unlike, uh, 
Sorry, Chris, you're, you broke up. I didn't hear the answer to that. Can you say it again, Fidelity? I missed it. Yeah, whether the multi-species herbal lays that people put in, you know, for every three or four years, whether they have, they're diverse enough to have the same benefits to livestock health as natural meadows might have. I would have thought unlikely. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. 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 Rob, do you have a view? Yeah. Yeah. If, if you've got a permanent pasture, you might as well aim for a diverse permanent pasture. They can be useful in an arable rotation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've had the suggestion for managing ragwort and actually I can say at home that we definitely put our sheep through um, any fields that have got ragwort in in the early spring and they actually stop it coming through they just nibble it off and it yeah. seems to be fine. Um, a question perhaps again about how Rob's form of grazing works alongside ground nesting birds. Um, yeah well it, it works fine actually um, we don't have ultra high density grazing and we tend to find nests are intact. Cows are actually quite careful where they put their feet when they're not under stress. Um, and so, yeah, we've got loads of skylarks, um, ground nesting birds all over the place, curly coming back. Uh, Rob, can you advise on the best mobile troughs to use um, and what sort of price are you getting for your cattle? <laughs> This is getting very detailed. We say, well, Kiwi Tech drag troughs are really good. So are the micro troughs. Um, the uh, but I would I wouldn't use the quick coupler. I would use a Plasson connector with it. Um, we was sold it selling. We sold some stores for two pound a kilo a couple of weeks ago. That's pretty standard. Um, we sell our breeding bulls for about two and a half thousand on average. Um, and we sell breeding females for um, 1500 plus. Uh, lots of uh, more questions. David Finley is asking some very technical questions about soil organic matter, parasite control. Um, I think these are all questions we, we've um, we have reached seven o'clock and I think we should stop. But I think today's been absolutely fascinating and some of the questions could be topics for other webinars we're doing. So even if we don't do them jointly with Plant Life, the PFLA has been doing our own webinars, some of which I may say are only open to members only. So for instance, in um, a week or 10 days time, we're going to have a webinar on bale grazing, which some of you might be interested to join, but join in on as a discussion with everybody but that will be um, a membership only one so um, I feel that this tonight has given us loads of food for thought and lots of areas that really we could delve in an awful lot deeper on so again if any people listening in have ideas for topics that they think we could cover please just email Jimmy at the PFLA and we'll definitely see if we can work them up so I think it really remains for me now to just thank our three contributors for a really fascinating evening. And I'd also particularly like to thank Neil and Matt, who've been answering all those questions behind the scenes and helping to gather together um, the questions for us to raise in discussion at the end. So um, I wish you all a really um, good evening and many thanks. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.